place is no one. And it's forever. Ghosts of my life. How old are you, Twillers? Sixteen. And is it your birthday? Yeah. How old are you? Seventeen. Oh, seventeen. Oh, goodness gracious. Twins are sixteen. Here we go. Are you a beauty queen? You must be a beauty queen. Sort of. Sort of. Where do you come from? Bournemouth. Bournemouth. You must be a beauty queen. Is that... Is, you don't have a lead with that colour, do you? Sometimes. Do you? <clears throat> That's good. Is that husband, Brian? Sort of. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you what we'll have now. At number 19, ladies and gentlemen, part of the union from the Straubs. That was gross. <laughs> Doing Jimmy Saddle, baby. All right, we are Lost Futures, a Mark Fisher podcast, and I am Stephen, and this is... Marlo. And today we're doing Now Then, Now Then, Jimmy Savile and the 70s on Trial, the last entry into the second chapter, The Return of the 70s. And the it's... chapter one of the second chapters. Right. <laughs> like Kingdom Hearts. It's, it's a pretty uh, easy essay to get through. Yeah, especially if you don't have any, like, trauma or uh, connection to this individual at all. <laughs> um, either culturally or personally. Right, and... Yeah, no, it's super easy, man. Uh, if you're living in fucking breeze. Britain right now, and you do know somebody that knows Jimmy Savile... Or which just, like, again, you, you know, you grew up watching him, and, like, you have to contend with these two ghostly images in your head of the different ghosts of jimmy savile and you're trying to rectify that you know so anyway this is worth pointing out written uh july 2013 so what he died uh the 2012 2012 okay so before we get into this all right real quick for the americans who also are cool enough to ignore literally every news story to come out of england right um if you've never seen or heard the bbc Right. Uh, Jimmy Savile was a television personality who occupied some weird space that's somewhere between Dick Clark and Mr. Rogers, I think is fair enough to say. Yeah. Uh, except, like, way weirder and more English. And anyway, he was, like, a serial child rapist who used his position of being a donor at children's hospitals to be allowed to go to the hospitals and rape children, and he did that for, like, 30 to 40 fucking years uh, before he died. And a lot of people in power knew about it, and uh, it was kept completely under wraps actively by the BBC, as well as other organizations uh, for the entirety of Jimmy Savile's life. And then it all came out at once, like a month after he died. So that's the context. This is where the essay starts, is Jimmy Savile dies, and then the stories start coming out. After he died, they had a month of mourning Jimmy Savile, and then immediately after that. Like flipping a switch. Yeah, you had just investigative piece after investigative piece, revelations that, oh, wow, you really wrote these investigative pieces quickly. No, we didn't. These investigative pieces were written in 2004, and the BBC shelved them. Yeah. There were interviews that were with him that were like, he gets into it in the well, essay. I mean, okay, so yeah, it was also a persistent rumor-ish during his life, which was like not ever really threatening to him, but also this weird way that people who knew laundered the truth. Seemingly. Yeah. Oh then. Well, there's a video that I just found on YouTube of him molesting a girl on screen. Right. In the middle of a show, like mm. I don't know if he like upskirted her or if he just poked her in the stomach or did whatever, but you can see her like visibly on screen, like shaking a bag. And, and of course, it's England, so when people found out about who he was, that became a huge news story where that woman was hunted down 40 fucking years <laughs> later and Jesus interviewed. <laughs> 
So the essay starts out, I'm going to say, once more, structurally hauntological. It's uh, discussing the killing of not a body, but a body already dead. It's a very good beginning. He's yeah. really good at his first lines, which is... Well, yeah, and I, again, you know, just to bring all these essays under this hauntological umbrella, this idea of melancholia versus mourning, of detaching from the ghost versus still being attached to the ghost. In this case, we are discussing the body of Jimmy Savile is dead, and now we must kill the name of yeah. Jimmy Savile. Oh, yeah, I mean, he does mention this, and I think it's worth mentioning. They literally dismantled the man's headstone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think he even mentions, like, a medieval anti-vampire ritual. Like, well, yeah, no, because that was it. So a family who had a child buried in a plot near Savile was, like, filed a complaint to get Savile's body exhumed and moved. It was a huge scandal. I, I compared it to, like, Bill Cosby if Bill Cosby had died and then all the accusations yeah, no, I think came Bill out. Bill Cosby is the closest analog that Americans well, would know. Like, as far as the emotional place, if not the actual, like, pop cultural job. Right. I, but like, also his the, job, he was Dick Clark. Uh, all, all, it was just a way more popular. Or Carson Daly for the more, like... Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, same thing. The but. younger kids that in our... The, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, he, goes, yeah. he, he says... I, I would say Dick Clark just because when Dick Clark was Dick Clark, he had a status like Jimmy Savile had. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, like Jimmy's, in the '60s, but of course, uh, Jimmy Savile was also England is culturally like fucking trapped in this like 20 years in the past. J Jimmy Savile was also a DJ. That's how he rose to prominence. Mm -hmm. He was uh, well, uh, yeah. just everywhere. Yeah, so uh, he was initially a DJ, and I think in the '60s he had like clubs and like parties that got known. Uh, and then got in the BBC system, hosted Top of the Pops. Yeah, that's uh, what we were listening to before. had another show called Jim Will Fix It, in which he took letters or something from children about issues they were having. I don't know how he Yeah, I think it. that's that's where the now then, now then comes from. Right, right. Yeah, and that's where he like also kind of got this more Mr. Rogers-ish role of dealing with young children and that association rather than like the teens and shit on uh, top of the pops but anyway i think we got more or less the context down <laughs> so uh i guess just to really piece through the essay like we said he kind of starts on this notion of some kind of ritual assassination yeah. the killing not of a body the body was already dead but of a name it was as if some kind of deal had been struck. You'll get to live out your life with your reputation intact, or as intact as it could be, but a year after your death, it will all be destroyed. Nothing, absolutely nothing will survive. Your headstone will be dismantled. The penthouse in which you lived will be demolished. Your name will be synonymous with evil. Right. Awesome first paragraph. Yeah, so he gets into... Savile and the interesting kind of dualities or contradictions of Savile of being both this sort of grotesque figure, this like freakish weirdo, but also comforting, I guess. I don't know. Like it's like, it's similar in the way how he described George Smiley as like not quite comfortable or asexual i think is more or less he says it later but it's like grotesque the yeah thing it almost of reading him this essay a almost kind of reminds me of your prototypical like um guy you know shoots up a fucking mini mall and the neighbors are like oh yeah it's a quiet dude like reading through this essay i don't necessarily and this is partially i guess my cultural unfamiliarity because i don't know that i get that anyone was surprised that he was a serial pedophile <laughs> but it seems like people must have been surprised that he was a serial pedophile i'm not sure why the way mark fisher describes him seems like this man was a 
pedophilic rapist who, like, also was weird to be around. Yeah. And disconcerting, generally. But anyway, so... Like, he goes into Have I Got News For You is a satirical program that you and I have both watched. Like, that... Have I Got News For You, we've seen that on YouTube. The uh, It's not QI. No, no, no. It's the Have I Got News For You, where they go round table kind uh, okay, of okay. discussion. Of- yeah, well, and I mean, that's a... Um, in Have I Got News For You, okay, I, I don't know the episode, but it's a panel show. England loves their fucking panel well, show. Well, it was unbroadcasted scene that was cut. Okay. We all read the transcript of an unbroadcasted scene from Have I Got News For You where they openly accused him of being a sex abuser and, you know, it's supposed to be satirical, but Mm -hmm. the BBC cut it for some reason and then afterwards it came out like, oh, we had this, but we couldn't air it. Yeah, and I guess this is also kind of reminiscent of how he uses the big other in uh, capitalist realism where it's like this sort of weird, we all knew it, but we didn't all know it. And once one person said it, Mm -hmm. like... Um, yeah, except for the fact that apparently for like 40 fucking years, many people said it and it didn't do shit. But, uh. and, and here's one, because we are a theory podcast, the signature of a reel, perhaps, that could not then be recognized except in fiction, which, yeah. which gets into his relationship with Lacan. Yeah, and Zizek. And Zizek. I, I feel like the way he uses the reel definitely just has more Zizek in it because Zizek himself was very creative with how he used that from Lacan. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, Zizek famously had, like, five different kinds of the reels, including the real reel. <laughs> the literal yeah, I remember. Zizekian theory. Um, I that, forget what it is. Was that from Sublime Object? No, I don't think he really gets into it in Sublime Objects, but... um yeah, the real real is a thing. I forget what it is. But, uh, I mean, he uses the real, capital R real, in a bunch of his essays. But this one, he, in particular, gets into it a couple times. Where Which, he- you know, Lacan also relates the real to trauma. either trauma or a LSD-induced ego death or the, like, sort of instances that Lacan mentions as a point at which an adult brain can have the real invoked on itself. And there's certainly a, um, I think, psychoanalytic use of trauma throughout this essay. and uh, Almost a collective trauma. Right, in his way of analysis. And then um, he gets into the, right. I think what you were talking about, the big other, is very present here. Not in name, but like how yeah, it was in the open. We all knew. We felt that we knew. Right. But it it, you it know. mattered that it was never acknowledged, right? Uh, and the acknowledgement is more important than knowledge at this deep epistemological level. And the fact that he basically said it in the open. Fisher brings out the autobiography that he wrote that Seville boasted about having sex with underage runaways. Yeah, I mean, nineteen seventy four autobiography so you know him and jimmy page (laughs) it was a thing that british people did in the 70s well also let's let's be reasonable so did american celebrities in the 70s as well i think mostly english but 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 not like boasting about it i feel like that yeah well no there was definitely a point where from the 70s like, really no. and earlier there was a turn where pedophilia became pedophilia specifically adult attraction to teenagers went from being this humorous vice to or an, a monstrous thing or an idealized like well yes and also and i mean also we can you know if we we can do a very feminist reading and or materialist or whatever the fuck you want to say, but like you can break it down and there's certainly aspects that society to this day encourages and, you know, promotes. uh, She was just 17, if you know 
what I mean. <laughs> I do know what you mean. <laughs> John Lennon or Paul McCartney, I forget <laughs> who sings that, that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the good thing about being George Harrison is you're never going to be blamed for singing the pedophile lyrics. But, the uh, weird thing about uh, fuck Balls of Fire guy, Great Balls of Fire. Oh, um, yeah, we know who we're talking. About. <laughs> the Great Not Balls the Big of Bopper. The Great Balls of Fire guy went to London, and they like I, I remember in the movie where they just rolled a stroller out onto. Because he was married to his 14-year-old cousin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that actually... Even that is, like, one of those, like, weird things where it's, like... It it existed in this place where it's, like, it was a scandal, but it wasn't a crime against nature (laughs) and basic decency and not being a weirdo. Yeah, so... Um, Yeah, so... So, so a big thing you were saying was... Uh, you talked about this off, but the effect of charity hospitals so on that, the that psyche was, of British yeah, bu- so, I mean, well, bourgeois, British thing. bourgeois I don't know culture. If the essay gets Jerry like, Lee Lewis. Okay, Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, yeah, this is like kind of one of those things, but yeah, uh, he you know raised money for hospitals. It, I mean, it's sort of like Jerry's kids kind of thing, like. Um, he raised money for hospitals every Christmas, got access to hospitals that he raped quadriplegic children in. So then he uh, brings up David Peace, which I think is structurally important for how he laid this chapter out, because this is sort of the David Peace comes back once more. From and- the last episode last right right so it kind of is a twofold thing i feel like i mean i think it's mm, telling that in the last chapter he used the word anti-nostalgia specifically to describe david peace and this is sort of an anti-nostalgia moment where it's literally this person you attach memories of watching since you were a child to being inverted and revealed to be a horrible, traumatic monster. And also, it's like David Peace because a lot of children got raped, like in David Peace stories. Yeah, you didn't see it, but in the the third 1983, it's revealed that the big thing behind the Yorkshire Ripper that wasn't the Yorkshire Ripper was a priest that was holding children and basically as using them as sex workers and raping them from very young age mm-hmm. in his like dungeon underneath it. Right. So anyway, it's David Peace both in the like philosophical sense that David Peace is fucking miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also David Peace in the uh, plot sense. Well, and also the power sense in that... Well, those... yes, and also the power sense that this was allowed to happen because of... Institutional... Conspiratorial level involvement of power. Of like police. beyond negligence, absolute working diligently to allow this to continue. Yeah, happen. like the police, the politicians, and the media all watching each other's backs and right. uh, having the goods on the others, uh, the best kind of insurance policy, the ruling class model of solidarity, which I think is a good line. Mm-hmm. And so he, he links it to the Red Riding novels and... He goes Which back. also, I mean, apparently this was, according to him, this was a thing said at the time in England as his story was developing of, quote, this is like something out of a David Peace novel. Yeah. So on the baseline level, that was a thing that the general public noticed that it was, you know, rapey and child rapey like in the David Peace novel. <laughs> also, he's bringing this to a new level of discussing this way that we are handling the ghost of the 70s as it haunts us in the 2000s and 2010s. Right, because the the Red Riding series came out right Mm -hmm. before this in the BBC series, and then the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy movie came out in 2011, Mm -hmm. and all of these signifiers of the 70s he's noticing are continuing to haunt the moment that he's writing this, 2013. Which I find is a really good thread that goes through this chapter. Right. 
He also notes that literally it's happening around where Peace lived and was writing his novels. Mm-hmm. Like it's a literal um. right right down the street, like in Leeds, you know, where he started building his empire as a DJ. Jimmy Seville was out there. And he was one of the people that was initially accused of being the Yorkshire yeah, so, Ripper. Um, this is like also, yeah, a interesting side note that um one of the Yorkshire Ripper victims was found directly outside of Jimmy Savile's apartment or something, and he was absolutely a person of interest in the investigation. Yeah, yeah. and he was friends with the Yorkshire Ripper. There's a... Yeah, so he... Yeah, again, for whatever reason, uh, Jimmy Savile not only wandered children's hospitals, but also high-security asylums for the criminally insane, uh, where he met and befriended the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, And this was like a thing. And there's there's a famous there's a picture. famous photo that especially started circulating after all these revelations dropped of him with the Yorkshire Ripper and Frank Bruno, a troubled uh, boxer that whose story I barely read. So he he kind of goes through the nature of what was happening, which was you know Savile was specifically using charity as, as cover as cover that he you know, gain popularity, and he uh, also had direct connections with individuals in positions of power, and he sort of notes of interest, he then kind of gets into what we mentioned earlier about the curiosity of Savile's non-appeal. Yeah, popularity or non-popularity. Right, so in early test uh, screenings in the 60s for Top of the Pops, test audiences agreed that they made him uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like, I I don't, like, yeah, and so they were like, okay, well, let's stick with him anyway. And he, he notes... You know, Savile doesn't even have a Simon Cowell appeal, this being the 2010s, of just the guy you love to hate. He's just sort of a person you don't care for. My favorite line from this is, you don't have to be loved or even liked to be a popular figure. Yeah, I guess. Um, (laughs) And here's one section that we mentioned earlier. The grotesquerie meant that one of the most Initially, unnerving things about the revelations was being forced to think of Savile as any kind of sexual being, Mm -hmm. which you think is weird because he was a DJ and, like, uh, presumably doing drugs. Well, because even, like, in the next couple of sentences, he gets kind of into this where it's, like, someone I don't remember who says it's like the 70s have gone on trial, but it's a very particular strand of the 70s. Not the officially debauched rock and roll of the 70s, Zeppelin or Sabbath, but family entertainment of the 70s. The space that Savile occupied where he was on TV, he was on family time TV every day, he did the kids things later... For most of his career, it seemed like, I mean, Dick Clark, American Bandstand, except the show that lasted much longer and remained culturally relevant much longer than American Bandstand did, Top of the Pops. Yeah. Was sort of the thing. I don't know, like it's... Well, this got into, again, my comparisons to the way he treats George Smiley, because George Smiley also seemed to Mark Fisher in his rendering as an asexual... Mm-hmm kind of, I don't know if unlovable is, but definitely not a warm, inviting Mm -hmm. figure. And Jimmy Savile seems very much like, what is this person doing here? And I think we'll take a break and get to the next section and we'll give you a little bit of uh, John Linden. Because next section is uh, the conspiracies, Mm -hmm. the Epstein. Why not kill Jimmy Savile? I think he's a hypocrite. I bet he's into all kinds of seediness that we all know about but are not allowed to talk about. I know some rumours. <laughs> yeah, people always tell you some don't they? Ain't I a bitch, eh, don't you think? On occasion. I bet none of this will be allowed out. I shouldn't imagine libelous stuff will be allowed out. Nothing I said is libel. 
God, you see, you're really well trained. I mean, Shall I tell you a very good fix that I did with a young lady mm. at Buckingham Palace? Mm. I was at a reception at Buckingham Palace. That's the place where the Queen lives and Prince I know, Lincoln they keep the Queen there, yes. <laughs> and it's not an easy gaff to penetrate. <laughs> very, very... Wait, wait, wait. What's, what's that? that an easy... It's not an easy place to get into. Aha, uh-huh. that's yes. right. Yeah. So I was at this reception, and there was a, a very nice lady and gentleman said to me, my daughter would be so pleased to know that I've met you and this, that, and the other. And I said, oh, yes. Where is she? And they said, she's in the back of the car. I said, what, in the boat? And I said, no, we've sneaked her in the back of the car so she can say she's been in the palace courtyard. And I said, and you've got her stuck out there. I said, oh, leave it to me. And they went, no, no, please don't look. And they grabbed her and said, oh. So I went to see a minder and said, they've got this situation and I'm bringing a friend in. So I said, listen, no one's going to object to you. So I said, all right. Now, the Polish staff are the most excellent people, right? On the way out, I explained very briefly, I don't think, leave it to us. So I went out into the car park, which is a courtyard inside the palace, and I shouted the young lady's name. Next minute, she's holding my arm, and next minute we're marching up the steps right into the palace. Well, the staff had done it right. Two footmen opened the two great doors on each side. <laughs> there were all the majors and the colonels and the household staff. It's a most elegant situation and tremendously uh, rewarding, right? And of course, when she sees this spectacle of the carpet and the people all standing there, and they all give a little graceful dip as she walked by, and she was now hanging onto me like a life belt. <laughs> right? And we walked up the steps and into the room where the reception was, in a, a room called the bow room, and fantastic look. Prince Philip, who was a marvellous geezer, happened to be just standing inside the door. <laughs> Paraffin to somebody. <laughs> so I went. It's a, a prearranged signal, no doubt. <laughs> well, no, there's not a lot of people go. Psst. That was John Linden saying how he wanted to kill Jimmy Savile for uh, being a hypocrite and knowing rumors about him and not being able to say it. And then there was Jimmy Savile giving a story on a talk show about he's, how he snuck a, a young teenage girl into Buckingham Palace, um, which sets up our next section which is all the weird conspiracies around Jimmy Savile. Particularly during the 80s, it feels like. Uh, Savile had a very close relationship with conservative British society, namely Prince Charles. And Prince Philip, I think. Yeah. Uh, So there was a bunch of stories that came out about how uh, close to power Jimmy Savile was. Right. Thatcher... Hated a minor mission of hers to get him a knighthood. Yeah, uh, which he eventually got. Right. There was a famous story of Charles and Diana going to him to mediate marital problems. I feel like Fisher's really acting like, look, man, I I didn't even know this guy. (laughs) In this essay, like, I feel like he's not, because even this, it comes with this parenthetical of, why would you even want Jimmy Savile's advice on your marriage? But for the sort of person he occupied, I could see why that would be considered like, oh yeah, that's a cutesy thing that the royal family gets to do. Like they get America's favorite, you know, guy who teaches kids about talking stuff out. This is a wacky dude. <laughs> you know, it's a little more Mr. Rogersy, but like, I mean, still, he, you know, oh, he has like just the folksy wisdom of good old fashioned common sense and conflict resolution, and he's going to help you with your marriage. But yeah. I, well, I this know. is again like you butt heads with Fisher here, as in the last section when it was like, couldn't you imagine him as a sexual, like, and this is like, can't you see him being a yeah, vice counselor? Yeah, I mean, counselor? I just feel like Fisher is really painting this picture of, like, look, there's no reason anyone ever could like this person. And it's like, well, demonstrably, they did. Well, yeah, but... Demonstrably, he was a major celebrity who was much beloved by everyone in the country throughout his entire life until a couple weeks after he died. I do feel like Fisher is taking the position that... Well, I didn't think that. Yeah, like, yeah no, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. That's like, what I'm saying. And those people were like fucking crazy for thinking that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it just feels like all of a sudden, like, Morrissey's going to say some racist shit and, like, Fisher's going to be like, well, I never even fucking listened to Morrissey. No, I hated <laughs> the Smiths. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, he gets into, as soon as all these scandals broke, 
course, Murdoch's going to jump on this because it was mostly the BBC dropping the ball on this one. Well, 100 percent. I mean, right. well, I mean, he pushes uh, Fisher pushes back again. I mean, Fisher does say like, well, OK, Rupert, where the fuck were you? You know, to be fair, <laughs> it does sound like it was mostly the BBC. I mean, it'd be nice if, you know. Rupert Murdoch always does talk about the need for, like, a competitive journalism market while, ironically, creating monopolies. But, you know, it would be nice that if uh, competing investigative journalism Also investigated the yeah, would also sex accusations. Yeah, would also these seemingly incredibly well-known about allegations that were very easy to confirm, it sounds like. Uh, but, you know, yeah, sure, the BBC had, like, investigative reports they actively shelved but also there is an open question as to why any of murdoch's multiple properties didn't even have anything to be shelved on this i like you know, this it's line like, yeah there's a conflict of interest but isn't that why you rupert murdoch say that you rupert murdoch need to exist my favorite line is the BBC now in a permanent state of confusion about his role in a neoliberal world duly went into a neurotic, narcissistic collapse. <laughs> Which is just... Yeah, like I don't want to like be hyperbolic, but I think it's the child rape equivalent of realizing you were complicit in the Holocaust. Like It, it really does seem like BBC could not have been more culpable <laughs> in all of this <laughs> well, just as an outsider looking in you know 10 years well, later it, it, i am saying this barely is, researched it but this, oh this, boy it doesn't sound good this does remind me it has echoes of epstein in some sense like with the political right, if, high if jeffrey epstein was like Jerry Seinfeld and NBC covered it up this whole time. Like, <laughs> you know, if, if, if like there was also an element of like he was this public, you know, Epstein can hide behind the fact that normal people didn't need to know who Jeffrey Epstein was when he was around. Was Jimmy Savile on the Lolita? Like, if anybody. It'd be fucking weird if he wasn't. <laughs> right? Like. Yeah, I have no fucking idea. I mean, that... I'm sure someone's looked into this, but, uh... Also, like, yeah, all of um, Epstein's connections to English power with the Maxwells and all that. And also, like, possibly being a MI6 Yeah, asset. MI6 or Mossad agent or... Yeah, um... Yeah, I mean, that would actually be strange if known prolific pedophile... Jimmy Savile. Well, because Prince Charles was connected to Jimmy Savile. Right. Um, and also Epstein. Uh-huh. Uh, also, Jimmy Savile gave, like, interviews where he's like, I'm a pedophile and you'll never catch me. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I don't fucking know. It's, it's just, like, all the, like, if you could just, like, make up something, it's true. Um, well, uh, my favorite thing is that he quotes a long passage from some plug blog which i looked up it's mm -hmm. like a 2000s 2010 sort of in the same space as k-punk where mm -hmm. it's just like a, a an internet blog of like new journalism blogger sphere and it seems like it's a good enough deep dive into jimmy savile's like dj career that yeah it seems it, like he was a guy who organized a bunch of parties in the 60s and 70s in london and that was able to launch a career and also ingratiate him to people in influence which got him the bbc right, right yeah he fixates on jimmy savile's like catchphrase but he also points out that the Roots of the 70s, which he'll get into with next chapter. He's setting up the next chapter, which is about hauntology, the music genre of the 2000s. Because that also occupies the space of mm -hmm. ballrooms, plazas, empty dance floors. Because hauntology, the music genre, is like the death of the rave. What kind of dance music do you play when you're coming down from LSD after a long night mm -hmm. at, at the club? And for him, I think there's a symbolic thing about 
him being popular for being a DJ mm -hmm. because being a DJ, he was like the upper, you know, he is like the guy that gets mm -hmm. you dancing. He's the guy that makes you forget about death, which I think is a running theme through hauntology is that, you know, the disco balls and the dance floor is this like run away from death and what happens when you wake up the next morning and uh -huh. You know, that to him is like, I think there's an album that he goes into in the next section, the, you know, the night after the rave or the death of the rave, mm -hmm. because it's like this ambient in between space of yeah. like. This is also where he gets into what I noted as a somewhat Zizekian. Right. And I wanted to get to that too. But first, there's this placement. There's a placement where this existed and could be allowed to exist and happened in this kind of orgy that ended up being neoliberal kind of uh, an austerity through the 70s, 80s, 90s. It was allowed to happen, it was permitted to happen, and then it was no longer permitted by the 2000s, 2010s. And that's something he gets into throughout the entire chapter, that the mm -hmm. 70s was when you had this profanity you know you have these degradations of society that were allowed that was just passed off as like locker room talk or it was passed off mm -hmm. as just being kind of the weirdo at the party but then by the 2000 in 2010 the the disco ball was no longer spinning and the music was no longer upbeat it was all depressing it was all depressive drake is playing depressing music everybody's playing downer haze the party's over, how do we deal with the trauma of all the bad things we did in the last 50 years when it was okay to do bad things? Mm. And Jimmy Savile, as he says, is like, it put the 70s on trial right. at the time. Because right. leading up to it, all of this is just looking at why was this permitted? You know, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, why, why did we have this kind of trauma about post-colonial England and the declining empire? Why did we have all of these cultural artifacts that reminded of, mm -hmm. us of decline? And at the same time, we had this like exaggerated sense of pride about ourselves until it just broke in the 2000s. Right. Almost spiritually broke. And this is our way of dealing with it in the 2010s is by exhuming the ghosts of it and then like parading it around. And Jimmy Savile is like a pretty clear cut example of that. Okay, so the, the yeah, Zizek... Yeah, well, I mean, he, he closes off. What has happened can be pieced together only in retrospect. The powerful trade on the idea that abuse and corruption used to happen, but not anymore. Abuse and cover-up can be admitted only on condition they are confined to the past. I just uh, think, you know, in looking at this hauntological sense of time, there's a sort of interesting idea of only being able to deal with something in retrospect it kind of reminds me of a zizekian idea he gets into in sublime object about uh being able to contend with the present only once it has been confined to the past and sort of almost the idea of ontology being kind of an extension of that where you, at the same time that you're looking back, you're also looking at yourself looking forward. You're going to the dance floor dreading the next morning while mm. you're there. <laughs> like right, like right. you're you're already preparing for the hangover when you're mm. taking the drink. Yeah, so it was just a... Well, I, I mean, I think that wraps around to the real, which we discussed. Yeah. Like, the real being... Yeah, that being the other sort of Zizekian thing he kind of was playing. All while never actually mentioning Zizek. And if there's any grad students who want to say I'm wrong, fuck you. But, uh, yeah. Well, I think it also reminds me a lot of the David Peace connection where he thinks that mm -hmm. is approaching the real... Right. Like the David piece is approaching the real, whereas something like Life on Mars is simulating and repressing mm. the real, which is the horrors that the 70s were. Right. 
You know, I, I find it interesting even looking back on um, the first chapter and his idea of nostalgia compared to what, where it's like, I think it's fairly clear the difference between hauntology and nostalgia. I mean... Well, what, yeah. what do you think? Well, is no, just nostalgia is life on Mars and hauntology is David Peace. I mean, again, he uses the term anti-nostalgia. He's very much not pushing nostalgia. There's nothing about any of this chapter that will make you think that he looks back fondly on the 70s. Right, and I gotta say, I, I recently went to a 70s-themed party mm -hmm. where a lot of it was similar to what we're talking about here, which is uh, griping about how we can't do the things or say the things that we used to be able to do. Yeah, no, they should um, put on a 70s theme party where it's just everyone pretend to be afraid of the son of Sam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everyone just has to be miserable because they can't afford any... Well, I guess, hey, yo. Uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah, no, everyone's just like, ah, oh, fucking Carter and the Iranian hostage situation. I was talking to, to my friend who was like, yeah, I mean... I gotta say, 70s music, worst pop music of all time, and I, I never want to listen to it ever again. Right, and I found... That. <laughs> I strongly disagree but, with But, I mean, he's... Some of that. He's not talking about the music you listen to from the 70s. Yeah, no, he's I He's mean, talking I'm, about, like, the strings, the... Uh, I mean, when I'm thinking about 70s pop, I mean, I don't know, like, what are we saying, like... You know, Bee Gees or no, no, no. I think he's talking about the, the Motown, like the schmaltzy kind of journey st string arrangements behind every single semi disco song that you know was on rotation if you went into any popular place. Yeah, I mean, like again, like I mean, to me, seventies pop could include Creedence Clearwater Revival. Right. No, and like, and to me, there's there's some of this. I thought it was an interesting conversation right. because there was a rosy picture depicted of the 70s at this party where people were very nostalgic yeah, you know, for it. it's a fucking party that has a theme. Yeah, everybody Again, everybody was like... everybody was dressed in bell bottoms. They had peace signs. It was mostly people that lived through the 70s, which I didn't. Yeah, Neither did like, you. What, what do you think? Like, oh, hey, let's have a fucking key party with the fuck ugliest people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, oh yeah, great fucking 70s party. Let's do quaaludes, have interesting ideas about how consent works, and uh, then uh, be afraid of the son of Sam killer. Just just be miserable, because yeah. it is... It Let's was... be angry at Carter. <laughs> I, I think of all the videos taking or movies taking place in the seventies New York, and it all seems like the trains are always breaking down. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like austerity was just about to set in. Oh, you got my dinner with Andre. Yeah, neither one of us experienced the seventies, so the only experience yeah, yeah, we yeah, have yeah. of the seventies is through Serpico, starring Al Pacino. Yeah. Well, well that, that was, was fun. that was the end of the. Chapter one, the second chapter, the return of the 70s. And next episode, we're going to get into chapter two, the third chapter, Hauntology, yeah. which is a very long chapter and looks at a bunch of Mark Fisher's favorite new artists who are dealing with the mid 2000s, 2010s kind of new labor government and dealing with being sad after rave's end that's yeah you know, burial the caretaker yeah it's gonna be fun we get into the shining you haven't seen the shining marlo's never seen yeah, the shining the first time I've ever so we're gonna the we're shining. gonna we're gonna because the caretaker takes his name from the mm. shining because cool <laughs> I can't Join wait. us next season for less than nothing by Slavo Zizek, Hegel in the Shadow of Dialecticals. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm kidding. That's not going to happen. No, we're. That book is 900 pages long. <laughs> well, that's the joke. I, I mean, I am excited about K Punk. All right. See ya.